Well, I'd like you to look at 2 Samuel in chapter um, 1 in verse 17. If I were to ask you what you know about the song of the bow, well, this is it. It's a, an Old Testament hymn, in a sense, that David wanted all of Israel to learn. One of my favorite poems is by a fellow named Rudyard Kipling. Y'all know that name? Rudyard Kipling, an Englishman, wrote, spent much of his life in India, and he wrote at the turn of the century and prior. Uh, he was in the, uh, uh, in America, it would be the antebellum period. Uh, he wrote when all world history was in transition, that you had the beginnings of communism that would come up, the beginnings of post-modernistic philosophy, uh, you would have the beginnings of Nietzsche's ideas. You saw the um, uh, rebellion against imperialism and colonialism, Africa and India. And uh, it, it was just a very, tra an enormously transitional period of going from uh, more historic Judeo-Christian ideas to modern and even postmodern ideas. And he wrote right in that the warp of that period. And he wrote a poem called The Gods of the Copybook Headings. And back in the old days when they had school copybooks, we used McGuffey's readers over here, they saw fit not just to teach you your letters and arithmetic and how to read, but there would be copybook headings, little notations at the top of the pages, and they would be moral maxims. The wage of sin is death. A penny saved is a penny earned. Uh, a stitch in time saves nine. Uh, the free gift of God is through Christ our Lord. They would have biblical and moral ideas because they felt that it wasn't just enough to teach you how to read and write. You needed to know how to live. And Rudyard Kipling wrote this poem on the gods of the copybook headings. And you can Google it up, look at it. It's, it's still a phenomenal idea. And his thought was that new ideas come and go. New ideas of God and reality come. And then, to paraphrase it, a civilization falls off its ice field. It slides off because there's no stability. And you see all the new guys say what the new guys say because they're just speculative until the civilization craters. And then, he says, you go back to the gods of the copybook headings. You go back to the ancient notion of Jehovah and Israel and the Old Testament, the anticipation of Christ, his death upon the cross, right wrong, the new covenant, that all of the newfangled stuff is okay, but it doesn't work. Amen. This guy saw it. And he said, the gods of the copybook headings always return on you. Always stay rooted with what you know. Don't be impressed at the new ways. You always go back to the old. You may have to live in a new day, but you have your anchor of the soul connected to God. Well, keep that in mind. The song of the bow is about David's um, remembrance of the final battle of King Saul and of David when they died at the hands of the archers. It would be like when we sing in our culture, Davy Crockett killed him a bar when he was only three. Anybody know where I'm coming from? That's in like Habakkuk, I believe it is. We all know about Davy Crockett. We sing about the Alamo. Uh, when Johnny comes marching home, battle him of the Republic. They're ancient memories of ancient and great stories or great people. Well, Israel had those in certain non-canonical works called like the Book of Jasher, the Book of the Chronicles of the Kings, things like this, the Book of... They mentioned a number of them in the Old Testament that were volumes that they kept. Well, the, this is one called out of the book of Jeshar, the book of Jasher. And it's the song of the bow. 
And David wants you to remember something. What it is, it's a funeral dirge. Now, I have done a number of funerals. Some funerals are easier than others. Great saints are easy to bury. They were great early on. They continued and they died faithful. It's a marvelous funeral for their going home. Other folks are difficult. And one of the most difficult are saints who did not finish well, Christians who didn't finish well. And you have to winnow out the good from the bad. You have to make cursory statements at the beginning so everybody knows you're not just blowing smoke. You know who this is you're talking about, but you can't dwell on them. And then you move to the things that you can remember. But that is a difficult funeral. That's a hard funeral. This is a difficult funeral for David. He's going to honor Saul. He's going to remember David. He's going to forget some things of Saul and remember, I'm sorry. He's going to honor Saul and remember Jonathan. He's going to forget some things about Saul and remember all about Jonathan. He's selective in his memory. When I bury you, Lord willing, don't make me do that. Give me something to work with. Don't let me try to work around and dodge and weave around all your rotten stuff. Uh, I'm going to charge your loved ones $1,500 to bury you if you do that. That's an expensive funeral. A saint, that's a $300 funeral. You don't have to pick and choose. You just talk about them. Everybody amens you. Man, well, that's why I say to Kendall, I can't wait till you're dead because, man, I got such a great funeral for you. He don't think it's funny. In verse 17, David chanted with this lament over Saul and Jonathan. It's a funeral. And he told them to teach the sons of Judah. I want you to learn this song. A song about our heroes. Don't ever forget. This song has got a major key and a minor note at the end. It's good about Jonathan. It's hard about Saul. He is going to to honor Saul, a lesser man would wreak vengeance. He would sing about how sorry Saul was. He would elevate himself and talk about how he thanked God that this person was dead. He would sling mud all over their memory. But David doesn't do that because this man is in a position of the anointed. You don't salute the man. You salute the rank. You learn rank in the military and you salute the rank. No matter the man, David salutes the rank here. This is the king. He's going to cover up Saul's faults. He's going to remember the good things. Here's the good thing he remembers. If you'll look like um, in verse 19, your beauty is slain. Saul was the anointed of God. He's the king, and that carries dignity. Saul, in verse 22, is a man of war from the blood of the slain, the fat of the mighty. The bow of the Jonathan didn't turn back. The sword of Saul did not return empty. He thinks probably of Saul's earlier life when it says he smote the Philistines on every side and he remembers those good days as opposed to the tragedy and the loss to the Philistines, the days of cowardice when his soul was frightened because he didn't walk with God, the days when he backed away from Goliath. No, he remembers the good days, the early days when this man walked with God. In verse 23, Saul was of an agreeable temper. Jonathan was beloved and pleasant in their life. He remembers when he was a good father to this boy. And he and Jonathan were inseparable and they fought side by side. As opposed to later days when he threw a, sword, a spear I mean, at Jonathan's head. He remembers earlier days of faithfulness. And he remembers uh, in verse 24 that he enriched the nation of Israel. Daughters of Israel, weep over Saul who clothed you luxuriously in scarlet and put ornaments of gold on your apparel. In earlier days when he saw victory and we were a great nation because of it and Jonathan was a happy boy because of it and Jabesh Gilead never forgot Saul's delivering them from the Ammonites. Now, I want you to notice a motif that's going to go through these next two paragraphs. And that is that all the good that Saul did was remembered. 
And the good was from his earlier days. And the good was from when he walked with God until he fell away. Just like a funeral. You remember the good, the days when they walked with God. Good old days. In verse 22 and 5, he remembers the Jonathan, how courageous he was. From the blood of the slain, the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan didn't turn back. Verse 25, how the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. He was in the thick of it. Jonathan slain on your high places. In a battle, the enemy would back up to a high place and you would have to take them on. It would be like Normandy. It would be like Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg. Very difficult times. And he said Jonathan was there when it was tough. And he remembered how pleasant Jonathan was in verse 26. He says, you've been very pleasant to me. Your love was more wonderful than the love of women. Michael was, uh, what's the term? She vacillated. She was faithful to David, and then we don't see her anymore until later on when David has to go physically bring her back. Uh, she would not stand by David. She claimed that David threatened her and escaped from the house, if you remember. Jonathan was loyal to David, even to the laying down of his own life. And his major concern is, in verse 20, is God's honor. Tell it not in Gath and proclaim it not on the streets of the Ashkelon, or the Philistines are going to rejoice and they're going to exult. He remembers that in later days, as opposed to earlier days, this man saw great defeat because God's hand was off of him. And now the pagan's going to laugh at us. The pagan's going to make fun of us because we departed from good old days. He says in verse 21, as Jesus cursed the fig tree, he curses the mountains of Gilboa. Let not dew or rain be on you nor fields of offerings. If you can't bring up grain for an offering of worship, a grain offering of delight, then you have no reason to grow at all. If you can't glorify God, Gilboa, you have no reason to even be here. Like Jesus with the fig tree, symbol of Israel. If you will not bear fruit, then you will be cursed. And so... It's interesting that David remembers the good, but he has a final bitter word on how things had fallen. The point is, the early days of Saul were good, but sin ate his latter years. Sin took his own son, Jonathan, to his death. Sin took the army to their defeat. Sin robbed the women of Israel from the booty of victory. It's like a cancer got into our nation and ate it. But praise God for early days when we remembered the Lord. Will that preach? You think that's a good song for a king to sing at his inauguration? that the good old days are the days of faithfulness. But whenever we turn from God, there is shame and there is death and there is defeat and there is pain. Well, after that bit of encouragement, in chapter 2, it came about that afterwards, circle the word afterwards. In the Hebrew, the word afterwards means afterwards. There is always an afterwards for God's people. And out of this womb of death and pain, a new king emerges. God said to Israel, I gave you a king in my anger, and I took him in my wrath, meaning Saul. You wanted a king like the Gentiles, I gave you one. And you ended up with a Verse 17, a lament. 
And so now the chastening is over. The pain is over. He disciplines us for our good that we might share His holiness. The beating is over. And now I'm going to bring to you a new man. A man I've been preparing. King David, the beloved of God. And in verse, chapter 2, verse 1, the way is now clear to the throne. David is anointed. His army has come to him when he was at Ziklag. No longer just 60 or 600 men that were distressed and discontented and downcast. But now the faithful of the nation has come. First Chronicles 12 says, like a great army of God. Well, now it is time for him to accede to his throne. An, a lesser king would have surged into Israel, taken his place, and exalted himself and to say, I am now the king. I am the anointed. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess me as Messiah, as Christ. But David won't do it. What he does is, verse 1, he inquires. He goes to Abiathar, the high priest, and he calls upon the Urim and the Thummim, and he said, God, give me direction. Has God told him that he'll be a king? Yes, he has. Did God tell him when he would accede to the throne? He has not. Has God tell him where to go? What city are you going to go to? He doesn't know. And so the first act of this king is to pray and to say, God, you lead me. You tell me where I need to go. It goes like this. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your understanding. and all your ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your paths. Amen? Even when you know the general direction that God wants to take you to the throne, you're not sure as to the, how he's going to do it. And so you ask him. And so David goes to God in prayer. That's how kings are meant to begin their monarchies. They pray. They sing about good old days of faithfulness. They lament over the sin that may have brought them to that throne. And he asked permission. Shall I go up to the cities of Judah? Judah is David's home court. He's from Bethlehem of Judea. David does not overextend himself. He's very modest. Shall I go to my own people? I'm not going to go unless you tell me, and I'm not going to go where unless you tell me where. And I'm not going to ask for D.C., so to speak. I'm a Judahite. Do you want me to go just to my own people? He's very modest. And God says to him in verse 1, go up. David says, where? God says, Hebron. Why didn't he go to Bethlehem? Because Bethlehem, as I quote Micah, is too little to be numbered among the clans of Judah. Bethlehem would have pointed to David. Bethlehem had no great history. Matter of fact, I won't go into it, but he had a bad history from the end of the book of Judges. God doesn't send him to Bethlehem to draw attention to himself. God sends him to Hebron because it's about good old days. Hebron in Israel would be Boston to the United States. It's Jamestown. It's Philadelphia. Whenever uh, Israel was conquered by Joshua and Caleb, Caleb asked for a city. Y'all remember? The 80-year-old man that was, goes back was Joshua's sidekick, was a leader under Moses, and Caleb said, I want the city of Kiriath Arba, of the sons of Arba, for that was the place of the sons of Anak, Anakim, the, the tall ones or the long-necked ones. Are you with me? All the way back to Joshua. And Caleb said, I want that toughest place. And God said, take it. And he went in by the grace of God and he took it and he named it Alliance of God and Caleb. The name Alliance in Hebrew is Hebron. Me and you together, God, pulled this off. And so Hebron is Jamestown. 
It's a place of initial settling. Uh, it's also the place of Machpelah. How many of you know from your Old Testament, Machpelah? It's wherever Abraham said, bury me there. It's where Isaac said, bury me there. It's where Jacob said in Israel, take me, or in Egypt, when I die, take me to Machpelah. It's where Sarah was buried. It's where Joseph said, I don't want to die in Egypt, take me to Machpelah. You know where Machpelah is? It's Hebron. It's the place of the patriarchs. Abraham said, bury me at Machpelah, the site of Arba, the Kiriath Arba. Because he believed that someday God was going to surround him with a nation according to the promise. This is the place of the patriarchs. It's the place of Moses. It's the place of the conquest. It's also a Levitical city. In Israel, God doesn't let the Levites, the priests, and the deacons live in one city. That's the way we would have done it. He scatters them all out in 48 different cities that you give them prime real estate. One of the Levitical cities is Hebron. It's the place where you're closest to the people of God, the seminary profs, the teachers, the scholars of law. Uh, it's also a city of refuge. If you accidentally killed a guy, lest his relatives came and got you, you would flee to a city of refuge. That's Hebron. It's a place of justice, a place of mercy. And so whenever David is sent by God to Hebron, it's because God, I think, wants him to stand on the shoulders of giants. David, you're bigger than you. You go back to Abraham. You go back to Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Caleb. You go back to the Levites. You go back to the conquest. This is the place of faithfulness and the Abrahamic covenant and of trusting God and conquest, a place of truth, a place of justice. And that's where I want you to go. You know, whenever I leave my study in the morning, I've got a prize little deal in a frame. It's a little small tract that was put out by Dallas Seminary in the late 1920s. And it's the Dallas Seminary doctrinal statement of verbal plenary inspiration. Amen? And of the Trinity and the deity of Christ. And of justification by faith. And of this distinctiveness of Israel and the church. And the literalness of prophecy. And the tribulation and the pre-tribulational pre rapture and the literal second coming and the kingdom of God upon the earth. And that's that tract of Dallas Seminary, and I've got it right there in that little case. I was going to put it above the door and jump up and touch it like Notre Dame guys when they go out and play, but I can't jump no more, so I just got it where I can touch it. Play like a champ today, because I realize when I come up here that I stand on the shoulders of giants, of Hendrix, and Walvard and Ryrie, and as far as the inerrancy idea of Luther and Calvin. The church is a local church. The church is a universal church, but the church is a historical church. We stand on the shoulders of great men of good old days, of the gods of the copybook headings. And so there's something bigger than me here, and that, that's the Bible, that I stand and you stand in the succession of great, inspired men and women. We're a continuity. This is more than just a book. It's a baton that is passed on to us. And so, verse 2, not only shall he go to Hebron, but uh, in verse 2, David went up there and his wives, Ahinoam and Abigail, they have not borne children so far. How come? Apparently, God didn't want him to bear children among the Canaanites and in exile. God wants to give him children now, and so now their wombs will be open. They're going to drop one in the spring, two in the fall. <laughs> because God has his timing, see. And in verse 3, David brought up his men, and they lived in the environments of Hebron. These were the men that suffered with David in his exile when he had been rejected by Jewish leadership and goes among the, the Gentile, and the faithful of Israel come to him, and he suffer. Now there is the second coming of David. 
And now he will take his place. And so those that suffered with him shall reign with him. Sound familiar? That's 2 Timothy 2.12. Now, as Paul said, we shall reign if indeed we suffer with him. Romans chapter 8. You and I are like this. We have gone out to our king in the midst of an adversarial world. And we are willing to take the hit. But that's okay. You know why? Because we've read ahead. And we're going to win this thing. So suffer well. Uh, blessed are you when men persecute you and ostracize you on account of the Son of Man. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejoice and be glad. Great is your reward in heaven. You stand on the shoulders of the nobility of great men. You hang tough because your day is coming. Well, I want to show you something here. In, first, in verse 4, Now the men of Judah come and anoint David king over the house of Judah. First Chronicles 12 there begins a pilgrimage. All in the back roads of the faithful of Israel respond, not because they must, but because they must. They're not forced, but they see. As the men of Issachar, they have an understanding of the times with the knowledge of what Israel should do. And we have to respond. And now there begins to be a great army of God because their king has come. A couple of things right here. Uh, Number one, David will be willingly received. He will not force himself. You have to willingly receive him. Is this the custom of kings? Y'all remember the history you forgot? This is not the custom of kings. But this is the custom of a man who realizes he is a servant of God and he is to the benefit of the nation. He is a servant of the nation. I will do you no harm. You receive me because you want to receive me. In the same way, Christ stands at the door and knocks, and if anyone hears the door and opens the door, he'll come into him. He does not force himself. Even by the act of efficacious grace, he opens a man's heart to respond willingly. He will not force his hand. You receive him. And he will do so independently. Every single tribe and every single family and every single person, you don't get in simply because your daddy wants you. You've got to make that call on David. And he will accede to the throne by degrees. First, Jonathan says, this is the true king. I give off my robe, my belt, and my sword. I give it to him. This is the king. And then that king is rejected by the nation. And he disappears and goes among the Philistines. He takes the Gentiles and the lowly of Israel come out to him. And then he goes to Hebron. And we're going to have a civil war break out here in a paragraph between Ishbosheth, sponsored by Abner, and David. And we're going to have a time of tribulation. And now the faithful of Israel to recognize him and they're to come to him. And judgment will come upon those who do not. You know how many years of tribulation we're going to have? Seven years. And then he will ascend to the throne and bring in the kingdom of God. Does that sound familiar to you? He comes to the nation and the faithful respond. He is rejected and goes among the Gentiles. He takes the lowly of Israel and he takes the wise of the Gentiles. And then he returns. And for seven years, tribulation, he commands the nation to come to him. And then he will take his throne, just like Christ. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8. We do not yet see all things submitted to him. Christ takes his throne in degrees. And right now the Gentiles are coming. Is there going to be a seven years of tribulation? Yes, there is. Well, don't get me started. In verse 5, 4, now they tell David, David, the men of Jabesh Gilead buried Saul. Meaning, what are you going to do with these guys from a former monarchy that were faithful to that old monarch? You, you tell me. What is the custom of kings with those of an earlier monarchy where the monarch sought on a couple occasions to kill you and kill your men and kill the priest of Nob who supported you? What would a lesser king do? There will be a bloodbath. You know what this king is going to do? He will not raise his finger against anybody. 
Who were the guys that buried that king? The men of Jabesh Gilead. You remember whenever the Ammonites surrounded Jabesh Gilead and they said, uh, the men of Jabesh Gilead said, let's see if anybody comes rescues us. And if not, you can take us. And they said, sure, we're going to put out your right eye. And Saul showed up and delivered them. And whenever Saul was killed, the men of Jabesh Gilead took his body and buried it because they were the only guys of earlier days that really remembered what he had done in earlier days, in good old days. So those days came back to be a blessing. Well, David, what are you going to do with these men? The men of Jabesh Gilead were loyal to Saul. I know what a lesser king would do. You know what David does? Verse 6. I'm sorry, verse 5. May you be blessed of Jehovah, of Yahweh. You've shown this kindness to Saul, your Lord, and you have buried him. They honored Saul because they were loyal, good countrymen. David says, I have no personal ambition. I have no personal desire for glory. I seek to honor God. I am the servant of God. I'm the Christ, the Christos, the anointed one, the Messiah. I'm not king because I wanted to be king. God chose me and he took me from the, sh the sheep. So I'm his servant. I have no personal agenda. You are the nation of God. God made me king to do you good. This is called being a team man. It's a corporate man. I'm here for the king and for the people, not for my own career. Could I preach this at Congress? You're not here for party exaltation or for your career. You're here to honor God and do good to the people as a servant of the Lord. That's why in the book of Isaiah, Messiah is called simply the servant of the Lord. That's why Mark writes his gospel about the servant of the Lord. Matthew writes about the king, Luke, the perfect man, and Mark, the servant of the Lord. Who is he? Gospel of John. He is God. Well, in verse 6, may the Lord show loving kindness and truth to you. God told Israel, you will not lift your hand against God's anointed. You will be faithful to your leaders. And now God, because you were, were faithful, will show truth to you and loving kindness. God will be good to his word. And because you, he does this in verse 6, I also will show this goodness. Meaning, if you guys were faithful to God, then you have no problem with me. If you liked God, then you're going to like me. If God was pleased with you, then I am pleased with you. David says, I have no ambitions outside of the will of God. In verse 7, therefore, God's going to award you in verse 6 for your past. Now, therefore, let your hands be strong in the present. Don't grieve because this good man to you is dead. You let your hands be strong and valiant. Saul, your Lord, is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me, present tense, king. You know what we would say right here? Anybody old enough to remember FDR? Anybody go back? They used to sing a song back during the times of FDR. Happy days, anybody know how it goes? Are here again. You sing it best over a megaphone by Rudy Valley. Happy days are here. <laughs> because we got a new president and he's gonna make things right. Happy days are here again. And David says, happy days are here again. Let your hands be strong. You were done good by a man in the good old days when he was faithful. Well, now you let your hands be strong because a king has come and God is my sovereign. God is my lead. God is my director. Happy days 
are here again. Listen to this. Can't say it any better. In this, this what connects the song of the bow of the past and the accession of David to the present. In the song of the bow, the good days of the nation were remembered. The earlier days of righteousness were remembered. Faithful days were remembered. Days of victory and joy and bounty. In the succession of David, the men of Jabesh are rewarded for their devotion to Saul because of Saul's faithfulness in early days. Faithful days, good days, obedient days, blessed days. With Saul's death, these men now own a new king. Strengthen your hands. Good days have returned. A righteous king sits on the throne. Amen. The, day, the gods of the copybook headings. Israel returns to the one who brought them. Israel returns to the God of Hebron. The God of Abraham. And Isaac and Jacob and Moses. The God of Caleb the God of the Levites, the God of truth and law and mercy and justice. A God who for a generation was spurned and they knew the dominion and the weeping from the defeat by the Philistines. Why? Because they had rejected their king and now he has returned and happy days have come. Father in heaven, Maybe there is somebody here that was raised by mama and took to Sunday school, that was raised by daddy and was taken to vacation Bible school, that was raised in the church. Maybe somebody that knew the hymns. I think of my brother Bob and as he, he and Lloyd Campbell and others minister at that jail. Now, Bob said they will sing hymns at the end of their Bible study and those men will weep, they'll cry because they remember their mama. They remember their grandmama. They remember days of church. They remember the days of order and right and wrong and righteousness and faithfulness and peace. And they weep because they're in jail. And they long to go home like the prodigal son who came to his senses and said, my father's hired men have more than enough food. I'm starving here. I will go home. And I'll say, Father, I've sinned. I've sinned in your sight, but I've sinned against heaven. And I'm no longer worthy to be called a son. And the father saw him and ran to him and put the ring on his finger, and the shoes on his feet, and the robe on him. He killed the fattened calf. He said, this son of mine was dead and he's come to life. He's home again. And such was Israel. How blessed it was when Saul and the nation bowed down to you. And what horror of the decapitation of a man and his son. That his sin cost him his boy and it cost him his life and it cost him his nation. It cost him the joy of a good funeral. Sin ate him like a stage four tumor. It ate into his heart and ate out his family and it ate out everything. But now good times have come. The king has come and restoration can occur. And so you men of great memories, you old guys that remembered, you strengthen your hands because a new king is in town. And we'll thank you for our dear Lord. And maybe on this day that uh, those who have played the fool 
will repent. And they will, with empty hands of faith, come to him who died upon a cross for their sin and receive him as Lord and have their hearts changed and become part of his very body and could be reconciliated. They could be reconciled back to their sovereign and their God. Oh, the baubles of this world of our modernism, our communism, our Nazism, our existentialism, our atheism and agnosticism, and our scientism and humanism, and they have produced the waste of modern man. We return to the God of our fathers in Jesus' name.